you ever had the uh, challenge of walking somewhere at night where it's really, really dark? Now, I know in Omaha, that doesn't happen, but uh, other places it does. Uh, certainly, when we make our way to Africa in um, June and July, we over there, there are not street lights, and um, we don't see a light for miles around. It's really dark. And they don't have flashlights, and uh, they're walking. But it is, uh, you better know the path really, really well. You would not want to walk a path that's unknown, where you don't really know where the rocks are to trip over, and the snakes, and um, the cliffs, and all of that. Light is very, very important. Or maybe you've had the experience of uh, being a tourist in a cave. And one of the favorite things that they love to do in a cave is to get everybody into uh, kind of together in a group and then say, okay, we're going to turn out the lights so you can see and sense what real darkness is. And if you've ever been in that experience, then they turn out all the lights and it's so dark that they tell you, you can put your hand up in front of your face and you will never see it, okay? Unless you touch your nose, you won't know your hand is there. That's darkness. And really, these two are opposites. Light, there cannot be darkness. When you turn on the light, the darkness is gone. The world is in that kind of darkness spiritually. And you and I, as believers, are different. We are in light. And our passage today in Ephesians 5 tells us that we should be walking in that light. You and I used to be in that same kind of darkness. We just didn't know it. Much of the world today does not understand the darkness that they are in. Because if you were born as a blind man, never saw anything, you wouldn't know the difference. Unless someone told you, you would think, this is just natural, this is normal. No one sees anything. But that is not the case. If your Bibles are not open or ready, Open them to Ephesians 5. We're going to start reading verse 8 through 14. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is, all, is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful work of darkness but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Because you and I are believers... And we have been rescued from the darkness of the sin in which we used to live. Now, in Christ, we are light. And we are to expose sin and deal decisively with it. As we begin to read, I want to back up and read the closing verse from what we looked at last Sunday. Because we need to see that we are changed people. And the passage today is kind of an answer or a reason for verse 7. Verse 7 says, therefore, do not be partakers with them. Talking about uh, those, you know, living in sin. Do not be partakers with them for, beginning of verse 8, giving us a reason. Why should we not partake in sin? Why should we not partner with those who are in sin? Why should we not be partners with the unregenerate, for instance. It says, For you once were darkness, but now you are light to the Lord. Walk as children of light. This verse tells us that we are not to become partners because that is no longer our identity. We are now light, and light is not to have anything to do with darkness. Dark flees away from light. I'm going to ask you to keep your finger in this passage and turn back with me to 2 Corinthians 6. A few books back, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to read some verses there that, again, talk about this subject. 
2 Corinthians 6, 14 through the first verse of chapter 7. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Hmm, interesting. There's a parallel thought. What communion, what fellowship does light have with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial, uh, one of the names for Satan? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What part, what fellowship does light have with darkness? And therefore, we need to be careful that we don't get into a tight partnership of some kind with people who practice sin or People who are unregenerate, unregenerate, they are captured by sin. They don't even have a choice. Now, of course, some things come to mind here. We understand the temptation of young people to um, be attracted to and fall in love with a person. And you ask that young person, well, you're a believer. Are they a believer? Well, no, I don't know. I don't think so. I wonder, well, then... The Bible says, do not. One of the strongest partnerships humanly you can get into is to become one new family unit with a person. And you get all kinds of answers. Young people say, well, you know, we're in love and I think God led us together and I think God would be okay with it. No, his word says he's not okay with it. You're headed down a pathway of trouble. You're going in two opposite directions. And of course, this happens to business people as well who have good intentions and get into a business partnership or whatever with, a, with an unbeliever. And as a result, as a consequence, you got all kinds of, you know, competing ethics and, and decisions and so on. The Bible says, do not get into a partnership with those who practice evil. And certainly uh, a person who's not even a believer is captured by that. Now, the verse, back, flip back with me to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 8. For you were once darkness. We ought to know better. We ought to know what darkness is. You and I were once darkness. Now, I know that some of us had the privilege of coming to faith in Christ at a younger age. And that's a privilege. And sometimes you say, well, you know, I don't really have the kind of testimony some people have. And I didn't come to Christ and be rescued from drugs and all kinds of stuff, you know, that I was into. That's a privilege. God um, shields us from some of the consequences and scars of sin we can have in our life. But um, even then, we were born differently. We were born and we had all those selfish attitudes and all that stuff. Um, and so even if we came to Christ uh, early in our life we can understand that without him, we were lost. We were on our way to hell. And those of us that put our faith in Christ later maybe have experienced a bit more of that. But we were all darkness. We were all really part of that. We were victims of darkness. If you look back, last chapter, Ephesians 4, verse 18, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Here's just part of a description of what it is before we're a child of God. Alienated from him, blinded. Our reasoning is warped. It doesn't make the right decisions and so on. This is part of the darkness. And 1 John 1, 5 tells us a description it says, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. When you and I are captives of Satan, when we are, uh, before we put our faith in Christ, before the Holy Spirit comes in and enlightens us, we don't even comprehend. The world doesn't even comprehend 
what's wrong with their situation and how needy they are and the wrath of God that's upon them and where they're headed. That's one of the reasons that the book of John tells us the Holy Spirit needs to convict the lost person of coming judgment. That there's a judgment coming and Satan's already been judged and that Jesus Christ alone is righteousness and so on. Without that, they don't even comprehend that. They don't even know the darkness that they're really, really into. Well, verse 8 says, you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Now you and I are light. Once we put our faith in Christ, all that Ephesians has been talking about happens. And positionally, we are in Christ. We are seated in the heavenlies with him. And uh, all of that identity that we have. And we are light. We are no longer part of the darkness. We get that light, of course, because God is light. John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That same creator back in Genesis 1, 1 and 2, who, 1, who spoke and said, let there be light. He is light. Spiritually, it's a metaphor. Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. I am the one that shines the way. I am the only one who can rescue you from darkness. He is the only one that can, with our illustration today, flip on the light switch and the darkness is gone. That is Jesus Christ. And he who follows me shall not walk in darkness. Now, walking is a living, uh, as we've seen in the book of Ephesians as well. The person who follows Jesus Christ in their life is not going to live in darkness, but have the light of life. And that's what we need to navigate through this sinful world and uh, with all the fleshly desires that we talked about this morning in the nine o'clock Sunday in school hour, by the way, John uh, led us through a whole thing about David's temptation with Bathsheba and how we deal with temptation. Uh, if you missed it, I'm sorry you missed it. It's great. We need light to navigate and make the right choices. We have been rescued out of the kingdom of darkness. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. See, this darkness, this spiritual darkness has power. You can feel it. It controls you. I don't know if you've been some places, um, especially in some other countries, where you can feel the spiritual darkness. It's oppressive. Because people are trapped in it. And you and I cannot escape without the light of Jesus Christ. And you and I have been delivered. We have been rescued. We have been set free. We're no longer controlled by that darkness. And that's important for us to remember and realize. And... Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, a verse we looked at again in the, in the Sunday school hour. We are, there's always God, every temptation that comes to us, there's God always makes a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. There's nothing that you and I as believers ought to be trapped in. We can have victory. If we follow God, we reflect his light. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 5. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day talking in the context about the day of the Lord to come, uh, prophecy, that this day should overcome you as a thief. Shouldn't be unexpected. Shouldn't catch you unawares. You ought to know. They are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Again, this dichotomy of light and darkness. We are in the know as believers. We have God's word. We have the Holy Spirit living in us to help us interpret the word of God. And we ought not to really be shocked and surprised at where this world is headed and so on. Now, we in our solar system see the moon as a reflection, sort of, reflecting the light of the earth. And this is just a, a little diagram I found. But obviously, the moon does not generate its own light. It's reflecting the light of the sun. And we see that light as the moon as a light in the sky at night, which, of course, is nice if you're walking and don't have a flashlight. God provided that. But it is reflecting. Is you and I ought to reflect the light of Jesus Christ, of God. 
We are to be that light. And that light is not coming from ourselves. It's in the Lord, it says, verse 8. Now, we're, you are light in the Lord, not, not a light to ourselves, no matter how wise you think you might be and how wise your advice might be and so on. Uh, you and I are not the light. We are not the light to the dark world. It is Jesus Christ, and it's only because we're in him that we are that. Now, a light, of course, ought to be make a difference in a lost world. Matthew 4, 14 through 16, Jesus said, you are the light of the world, talking to his followers. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Not glorify you, not give you an award, not compliment you, but glorify God. Do you and I reflect the light of Jesus Christ adequately so that you are a light in your dark, your, wherever God has placed you, every school, classroom, the neighborhood, whatever place at work, um, you know, wherever God has placed you, wherever your relatives, your group of friends, wherever God places you, are you reflecting the light of Jesus Christ adequately so that people are drawn to him? Not to us, to him. And that is part of being light. In order for others to see our light, we must be different than the worldly darkness. Oh, that's a bad term. We don't want to be different. Now, we recognize that already for children in school. They want to dress the same and have the same things and speak the same and do the same things. They don't want to be different because that gets pointed out. That gets laughed at. That gets talked about. And so their drive is to be exactly the same. That doesn't quit when you stop being a teenager. <laughs> you know, we want to drive the same kind of cars and have the same kind of salary and have the same kind of house and the neighborhood and, and uh, all of that stuff that everybody else does. We want to fit in. This whole passage is about not fitting in with a dark world, okay? We, in order to be a light that we really are, in order to let that light shine, we need to be different. We need to be walking the opposite direction. We need to be doing and saying different things. Are we gonna stand out? Hopefully, you can't be a light without standing out in the darkness. And that's a hard lesson that we as believers can, you know, need to learn and consistently struggle with. We need to be different. We need to stand out. Well, the whole point of this passage, yes, you are not darkness. We are not darkness. We are light. But the challenge here is that we walk that way. So the next section, starting in the second half of verse 8, we need to live as children of the light. For you were once darkness, for now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now we've seen already, Paul always uses walk as a metaphor for live. Live your daily life. Live every moment of the day in this way as children of light. What does that mean? Well, our behavior should correspond to our position in Christ, first of all. Because our very nature is spiritual light, we are to live accordingly. Romans 13, 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Put on. Make our life daily, our words we speak, our actions, our thoughts, our motivations, Make all of that match our position, who we really are. Just like consider yourself dead to sin, Paul said, because you are dead to sin in the sense that it doesn't control you anymore. You are free. The Holy Spirit gives you the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to have victory in your life. Consider yourselves dead. Reckon yourselves dead, he says. Here he says, you are the light of the world because you have Jesus Christ. 
have the Holy Spirit living within you. You have the word of God, all of that. And now walk that way, live that way, live to let your light shine. Cast off the works and the deeds and the things that, that the world wants to do. Don't be partakers with them and put on the armor of light. We are to let that light show. Why? Because living in that light bears godly fruit. Verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now, verse 9 is sort of a parenthetical verse in here. If you uh, drop verse 9 out, you see that the thought just keeps right on going from verse 8 to 10. But it's a parenthetical thought talking about the fruit. When we talk about living a life, we want to live a life that is productive, not meaningless, not wasteful. Not, not accomplishing anything. None of us enjoy that. And God wants your life and mine as a believer to be productive, to produce fruit, good fruit. And here he says, if you and I live according to the light that we really are, if we live as a shining light, then the fruit that is going to show from that, and he lists three things. He says, it's all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now, of course, we know there's some other characteristics as well, right? Uh, over in Galatians 5, Paul added some others, the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit are really characteristics of the Holy Spirit. They're his attributes. And if he's in control of my life, which we're going to talk about later in this chapter, verse 5, or chapter 5 of Ephesians. If, if the Holy Spirit is controlling my life, then his characteristics are going to shine through. And no matter who rubs up against you, who rubs up against me, no matter... Um, you know, what the situation is, they ought to feel and see and get a reaction that is the characteristics of the Holy Spirit, godly. And of course, there's a longer list of them. But notice that all of these things, like we said last Sunday, are communicable attributes of God. Not the sovereignty, not the all-powerful, not the being everywhere at one time. Those things you and I will never uh, we can't attain to because we're created beings and only God has those. But some of the communicable attributes that he does want us to have are in this list. And here um, in verse 9, he mentions three of them, goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now, goodness is the quality of moral excellence, especially as a quality that is not stagnant, but actively working itself out. It is love in action. That's goodness. Love in action. Do people, last week, as you and I lived, and people rubbed up against us and had communication with us and contact with us, did they receive love in action? Did they receive that goodness? Righteousness is life in conformity to justice, to law, or morality as given by God. Philippians 1.11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. The fruits of righteousness. Righteousness means rightness of character before God and rightness of actions before men. We are right with God. That's our position. And now people need to see by our actions and our words and our motivations and our thoughts and, and all of that, they need to see that righteousness. Truth is conformity to reality or actuality often with the implication of dependability, conformity to the word and the will of God. A lot of talk about truth. Pilate asked Jesus Christ, what is truth? Truth is reality, and the only way you and I know the real reality is by revelation of God. For we don't know. There's lots of things we don't see, but God has chosen to reveal to us what the truth really is, what reality really is. And we learn a lot about the spiritual world and what God does in his reasons and so on. And that's reality. And everything else that the world who denies that reality, they deny absolute truth. Everything they really hold dear and believe is a lie. Because Satan is the angel of light. He is the master of lies. He's the master of deception. And he wants to deceive them. He wants to deceive us as much as we'll allow him to. And so we need to have the truth. Part of living in the light is knowing what the truth and reality really are and living according to that truth, not living according to a fantasy world. 
Now, we live in a culture and a generation where many of us, uh, the world is so dark, we really don't want to, you know, face that. We'd rather live in a fantasy world. And uh, we use all kinds of things to do that. Uh, any kind of thing that will alter our state or our focus. Anything from, um, you know, alcohol to drugs to, um, by the way, I read this week that um, some of our out in front entertainment people who are, you know, big into cutting edge entertainment are talking about, ah, we won't need movies pretty soon. You won't need that to, uh, to get into a new story and, and a new a fantasy world and all, you'll just take a pill. That'll be your entertainment. So, any kind of way, we can do it with video games, we can do it with novels, we can do just a fantasy world. Just function in a fantasy world, not according to the truth. That doesn't make all those things wrong, but, you know, we have to be careful why we use them. So, in the darkness of the world, of course, is characterized by the opposite of these three. Not goodness, not righteousness, not truth. The world is characterized by evil, wickedness, and falsehood, and we've been delivered from that. So in order to live as children of the light, we must discern what pleases God. Verse 10, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. That is one of our goals. That is why we don't want to be partakers in sin. We want to focus on our goal is to find out what pleases God. That is our goal. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. Why? Because we want his approval. We have his acceptance. We are already accepted by God. Positionally, we have been accepted. We're saints. We're totally righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ applied to us. We've been forgiven. We're totally accepted by him. You as a believer and I as a believer cannot possibly be more accepted by God than we are right now. After you put your faith in Christ. But he doesn't approve of everything we do, say, think. And we want to find out what is well-pleasing to him because we want to now live a life that is approved by him. Because someday there's an evaluation day. Paul called it the beam of seat of Jesus Christ. When we will be evaluated and we will hear either a well done, thou good and faithful servant, here's eternal reward, or we'll hear something else, which he illustrated in his uh, parables. So... You and I want our aim, our goal, and here's the Apostle Paul. His aim, his goal was that he would hear a well done, that his life would be approved, well-pleasing to God. And he comes to 2 Timothy, the last book of the Bible that uh, Paul wrote, and says, I'm ready to be offered up. He knew he was uh, sentenced to execution, martyrdom. And he says, I'm ready to stand before Jesus Christ and receive my crown of righteousness. He had lived his life well-pleasing. He, he could look forward to. He was not ashamed, as 1 John talks about. Don't live a life that will be ashamed to face Jesus Christ. Live a life so that you can face Jesus Christ in confidence. Acceptable dis, uh, means well-pleasing. Now, notice that it says in verse 10, finding out. The word in Greek literally says putting to the test. Approving or discerning. Romans 12, 2, or sorry, 1 Colossians 1, 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. There's that pleasing idea again. Fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renew of your mind, that you may prove. There's that idea of testing. That you and I may discern accurately what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Acceptable means well-pleasing to the Lord. We must be actively applying the word of God to each decision in our life. We can only do this if we know God's word and know how to apply it. If you don't know God's word, if you don't read it, if you don't study it, um, and by the way, I, if you saw in the news, they're doing studies that are coming out. Uh, people who claim to be evangelical, claim to be believers, um, and then they ask them theological questions. Oh, it's pretty stunning. We today are not uh, very knowledgeable about theology. 
and a lot of heresy that uh, people believe who should know better. We don't know the Word of God. We don't understand it. We don't apply it properly. And so we need to know it in order to accurately apply God's Word. We must make our decisions in line with God's Word. Only as our minds are renewed by the Holy Spirit, using the Word of God, will we be able to discern God's will. And that's the aim. That's the goal. To live as children of light means to live before the eyes of God, not hiding anything. John chapter 3, 19 through 21. Jesus said, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. The criminal likes to operate in the night, in the darkness. He doesn't like the light because it's going to shine on him and show what he's doing. You and I go to the airports and we walk up through these scanners, do we not? And we put our luggage through all these x-ray machines and so on. Now, if you walk in there and you have something to hide, you're going to be fearful and you're going to act a certain way. And by the way, they're watching for that very closely. <laughs> but if you and I have nothing to hide, uh, then we don't need to have fear. And that's what God is talking about. Live in such a way that you can live in the light and not have to hide and not be fearful at all. Dr. Warren Wiersbe says about this passage and uses an illustration of Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher in the past. Someone asked Charles Spurgeon, this pastor, for permission to write his life story. And the great preacher replied, you may write my life in the skies. I have nothing to hide. An illustration of living in the light. Now you and I need to live as children of light. That also means that the light of our character and conduct will help other people find their way because they live in darkness and they need to be attracted to the light. Well, Paul continues and says, we are commanded not to partner in sin, verses 11 through 14. Do not tolerate worthless sin, first of all. Verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Stop right there. Unfruitful works of darkness. Worthless. All the human effort that people put into their own good works or their own trying to help or whatever is worthless if it's not from God's light. They are worthless. They accomplish nothing positive. We are not to partner with sinful living. And by the way, this is a warning to believers, not only about partnering with unbelievers, but there are some believers who are not followers of Jesus Christ, who aren't living according to the position of light that they have. And so this passage is really a warning against us partnering even with other believers in sin, all right? Notice that it does not say that believers ought not to have any fellowship with people who are sinning. <laughs> well, we couldn't have any fellowship with anybody in the world. And we certainly wouldn't be very good evangelists because we couldn't have fellowship with anybody who's an unbeliever. We certainly need to reach out to them and befriend them and so on. But notice the verse says that we ought not to be partners with them, uh, fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. It's not the person, it's the sin, the things they do, the works that we are not to have any fellowship with or any partnership with. We need to be able to influence um, other people. Now, here's the question. Can you go to school? Can you go to work? Can you be in the neighborhood? Can you be in the sports team? All these things we do. Can you be there and have an influence as the light of Jesus Christ on them without them having an influence on you. Ah, that's a problem for the believers, for the church, isn't it? Who's more of an influence on whom? Am I more of an influence on them or do they influence me? 
Well, unfortunately, the church has struggled with being influenced too much by a dark, dark world. High school students preparing for college. You know, we, we want to be independent and uh, we're, we're done being at home. We want to go out and live in our independent life. We're going to go to college. Can't wait to get there in the first year and get started and be on our own and have this new college experience and all. The key question is, am I strong enough as a young person to influence them, that dark world of the university, rather than them influencing me? And unfortunately, statistically, we're losing that battle. There are many, many more young, believing Christians who go to university and their faith is so tested and denied, they come out having denied and giving up a lot of the things that they believed when they went in. Are we strong enough to be the light that this passage is talking about? Sin is worthless in that it does not benefit anyone, not even yourself. So we should not justify our sin by thinking we're helping someone else. There are some times that you and I feel under pressure to go along with somebody uh, doing things that are maybe questionable. Well, we're trying to befriend them. We're trying to help them. No, that doesn't help them. That is a lie. As spiritual light, we should expose sin for what it really is. Notice that verse 11 continues, but rather expose them. If you and I are light and our life is a light, we are to expose sin. Light shines on sin and shows it for what it really, really is. In this context, these works of darkness could be sins of a lost world, could be sins of other believers. It's not necessary to seek to understand sinful practices or try them before you can know that these practices, what they really are. Now the world says to you and me, well, how do you know this is bad for you? You've never tried it. How do you know drugs are bad for you? You've never tried them. Homosexuality, on down the list. How do you know? You need to try it with us first. No, you don't need to know. Uh, do an autopsy on a, you know, rotting animal body out on the pavement of the, of the highway. You don't need to do all of that to know that it's rotting, what it is, that it's dead. You don't need to be a part of their sin to figure out this is not good for me. God's word already reveals that and tells us that. We already know that. You know, you and I can know ahead of time by the light that's in us that this is sinful and this is not good. This has ramifications for us. Sometimes we don't need to even say anything. Our very presence as a believer, as the light, um, shows that this is opposed to us and we're opposed to it. Just think of Jesus in his life. Jesus didn't always even need to say anything, but the spiritual leaders of his day who were hypocritical were furious with him. They were furious with his presence. They were furious with his actions because he was the light of the world and he showed them up to be hypocrites. When others are doing things, even other believers, gossiping, complaining, grumbling, running someone down. You and I don't really always need to even condemn that. We can do the opposite. We can compliment that person. We can say, yeah, but, you know, something really good about this situation is, or this is how God is working, or something I especially pr appreciate about this person is, we can counter that. When someone's complaining about something in the church, and by the way, when we complain about the local church, we are complaining about the bride of Jesus Christ. Is it perfect yet? No, he's perfecting it, Ephesians 5. We'll get to that later in this chapter. He's working on it. But when you and I complain about it and grumble and criticize, we're criticizing his bride. And rather than that, we can speak words, as we saw in this chapter already, that edify, that build up, that complement, that, that are going to bless that person in that situation. Notice that it says here in this verse 12, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Sins done in secret are shameful to even speak about. Um, we don't need to go into great detail about the horribleness of sin. Uh, we need to just shine the light of Jesus Christ on it and it is show that it's worthless. 
Light shows the true character of the works. Verse 13, that all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light or are understood, are brought to understanding. For whatever makes manifest is light. Light shows the true character of works. Light exposes evil deeds so they become visible and understood for what they really are. When we see sinful practices in our life uh, as evil, then we can repent of these sins and confess them. Now, you and I are, can be deceived as well and say, well, this is not so bad. This is okay. This is the way everybody else is. This is the way my parents were. It's the way I've always been. And we defend it, all of those things. But until we're willing to see this as evil, as God's light, James says, come to the word of God and look at it like you look in a mirror and don't walk away and don't do anything. When you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror and you say, oh my, I need to do something with my hair and face and, and you do it. And until you and I are willing to admit, you know, this in my life is, it's evil, it's sinful, it's worthless. It does not go along with the light of Jesus Christ and what he wants in my life then we're willing to repent and confess it. 1 John 5, 1, 5 through 9. This is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There's that same concept we're seeing today. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we justify ourselves, we, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, part of, part of confessing is to say, this is wrong, God. My reaction, my anger, my response, my bitterness, my uh, unwillingness to forgive, whatever it is, it is wrong. It is sinful. It is not becoming of a child of God who is light and should shine our light in the world. And it is sinful. And I confess it is sin. And God cleanses us and gives us the power to have victory over it, gives us a new beginning. So... We must realize that sin is not only detrimental to us, but to other believers as well. The purpose of church discipline is to help a fellow believer to acknowledge his sinful practices so that he can repent and be restored to walking in the light. Believers are challenged to be aroused from their unfruitful lethargy. Look at the last verse 14. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Now, this is some sort of quotation in most of your Bibles. It's sort of set off as a poem. Um, it, it, you can find parts of this in parts of Isaiah. Maybe this was a, a hymn, something they sang or something uh, in the early church. Uh, Paul is quoting here that was kind of well known, uh, a verse that they would continue to repeat or whatever. Christ will give you light. In the, the original Greek says, Christ will shine upon you. And many other translations translate it that way. Christ will shine upon you. Christ shining on a believer someday, his future tense, by the way, someday he will shine upon you, speaks of Christ's approval because the believer is discerning and following what is pleasing to God. Someday you and I, as we stand before God, as we are evaluated by Jesus Christ, we want the light of Jesus Christ to shine upon us, his approval. That's what we want. And Paul is saying, wake up. Don't continue on in lethargy. Don't, you know, arise from the dead, resurrect, you are life. Don't stay in the tomb where Lazarus was, you know. Jesus called him out of there, raised him from the dead. Remove his uh, grave clothes as we saw a couple Sundays ago. Now live a life of resurrection and that's what we should do. Awake, arise from the dead and Christ will give you life or Christ will shine on you. Paul is calling his readers to live in Christ's resurrection and power as he lights their way. As believers, we walk in the light together. We will be able to expose sinful practices among us so that sin may properly be dealt with. And of course, to do this, we need to be humble. You and I are never going to confess sin. We're never going to allow God's light to shine on the dark things in our life and change them unless we are humble. 
As long as we're proud and say, I'm okay the way I am, we're going to be, um, we're going to just justify ourselves and remain in our dark practices. We're not going to live as a light. Sometimes we may even condone sin in other believers' lives when we tolerate it. And of course, we need to be wise and speak the truth and love and all of that. But the goal is that we all are living together to please God. When our sin is exposed to the light, the hold of that sin ha or has over us is broken. You know, James 5.16 says, confess your trespasses to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, it takes humility to admit sin and to confess that to one another. But perhaps you've experienced this. I know Sharon and I, as husband and wife, have done this. If we are open with each other and if we confess and say, you know, here's something that I'm really struggling with. I need victory in my life over this. Uh, please encourage me and pray with me and so on. Once we bring that out of the hidden recesses to the light and expose it, then the hold is broken. It's much easier to have victory. And I encourage us to humble ourselves and follow God's word and confess things. And brothers and sisters in Christ are uh, part of our strategy against it in strength. Again, this morning we ask, you know, who do you run to for help? There ought to be some brothers and sisters in Christ that you can go to and say, please pray for me in this situation, this temptation, whatever. We've seen today from this passage that because we are believers and have been rescued from the darkness of sin, we are to live in that light in Christ, expose sin, and deal decisively with it. Let me ask you, if you are told by the doctor that you need some serious surgery, how many of you would say to the doctor, you know what, I trust you so much, why don't you just do the surgery with all the lights off? You've done it before, just do it by feel. Not too many of you. No, that's why they put big lights in emergency uh, surgery rooms. I've been there. I've seen some uh, a surgery or two. They've got big, strong lights, sometimes headlamps and all of that. They want to see very, very clearly what needs to be removed, what needs to be done, what needs to be dealt with. And you want them to use that light, don't you? Well, we need to use that in our life as well. When our family had the privilege of ministering in Volgograd, Russia, we ministered with a lady there, Ludmila, and um, she was older, you know, in her 80s, and uh, she took us to the various orphanages and schools and, and whatever. And she, of course, told some stories of her life as we drove in the vans to these locations. She lived through World War II as a child. Uh, her family was taken by the Nazis as they were forced to withdraw. And uh, her father was miraculously saved when a lot of uh, other Russians that they had captured were killed uh, by bombing and so on. And so finally they were released and able to come back to Volgograd. And Volgograd is now a city in ruins. And they, they came in during the daytime and saw all this rubble and tried to find their area of the city where their house had been and they didn't find a single human being. They thought, my, this whole city is, is deserted. Where did all these people go? And nightfall came, and it was dark. There were no lights, no electricity. And Ludmila's father found in the rubble one lantern. And he found a way to light that lantern, and he set that there so they could kind of sit around it. And uh, as they sat there for an hour or two, they started to hear little noises dark out there couldn't see what was coming but all of a sudden people started one by one to come they had seen the light they were attracted to come out of the darkness and find someone else who was here and had come back to the city and just like that your life and mine ought to be the light of Jesus Christ to other people not only lost people not only a dark world but even other believers we are light. Does our daily life shine? Are we different enough so that that light is seen and can be attractive? Father, thank you for this passage. Father, thank you for all that you have done for us 
in Jesus Christ and who we are. Thank you that we are no longer trapped in darkness. You have rescued us from that. Thank you that you have made us in Christ to be spiritual light. And now help us to live up to our position. Help us to live a life that will be a beacon of light to other people. Other believers who need to grow as we grow together and as we deal with sin in our life and expose it and repent and confess. And then a lost world that needs to see the light of Jesus Christ. May we be different enough to allow our light to shine and not be hidden. May we not uh, hide it under a bushel so that nobody sees it as you said to your followers when you were here on earth. And we pray that we could be the light you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.